Okay, if you have that bulletin, this outline is an insert in your bulletin. Our focus is some of the things, whenever you see repetition, when you see a repeated theme, a repeated phrase, guess what? God wants you to do what? What's the Holy Spirit doing? Telling you to pay attention, right? So, Romans chapter 5. Um, we've got some messages that are on YouTube that you can go and look at. I can't repeat all of this. So um, we've come down to verse 5. To say this briefly, as a result of being justified, what do we have? Verse 1. Peace with God. We also have, verse 2, access into the grace wherein we stand, we didn't just have it dumped on us and then the faucet was shut off and we have to go get the blessings through works. The faucet's wide open. We stand in God's grace. It's all a gift. And what does it say we do? We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Part of the reason for that is why? Because trouble doesn't work shame like it did in Adam. Trouble in your life, you know, we're happy because our circumstance, outward circumstances are good. We're sad because our circumstances are bad. In other words, our Christian life shouldn't be governed by circumstances. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God because trouble doesn't work shame. We studied trouble does what? The outward man perisheth, but the inward man is what? Renewed day by day. And what's tr trouble ultimately work we studied? The love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Um, I was reading, uh, they call it an exegesis, you know, because that's kind of the realm it's written in. But all it is is talking about a specific subject. And the guy that I was studying was constantly going to the Greek and the Hebrew. Okay? And he was saying, well, you can't understand the face of the waters and the face of the deep. Um, unless you go to the original Hebrew. Listen, whenever you have to go to the Greek and the Hebrew to figure something out, you know what you're saying? The translation you hold in your hands is inadequate. God wants us to compare spiritual things with spiritual things. And you say, do I got to learn another language? A dead language? Koine Greek? In order to understand the Bible? Because most of us, how many of us here, how many of you here have a six month old understanding of Greek and Hebrew? Raise your hands. You don't have any understanding of it at all, do you? Pretty much no one in our culture has more than a three or five year old understanding of it, written and spoken. Listen, the Bible's translated. It says the face of the waters and then the face of the deep for a reason. The water's not just on the face. The water's what? Deep. God will do that. He'll say Holy Spirit. He'll say Holy Ghost. Why? You can't see Him. Can you see God the Holy Spirit? Uh, people say you can't understand the word redemption in Romans chapter 3, that noun, unless you understand the Greek. Lutros, agorazo, Exagorazo. So let's take our trip to the Greek to learn what redemption means. You can learn that by comparing Scripture with Scripture. I can show you the passages that teach all the elements of this compound doctrine, redemption. You don't need to go to the Greek. I would rather you didn't. Why? I would rather you spend time with the Word of God in the language that you speak than the Word of God through Folks that have no more than a five-year-old education in Greek and Hebrew. Or rather, I would rather you know this book in the language you speak. Is English the language of trade and commerce? So far. <laughs> um, in this country, a lot, of people, a lot of people speak several languages. Who speaks a language in, in this group right here? Foreign language. Oh, look at that. That's exactly what I'm talking about. If I said that in a European school or location, what would happen? Who knows six? 
Why do they all know English? Same reason everybody knew Greek. And if you didn't know Greek, you were called a barbarian because you didn't have access to the language of trade and commerce. It's funny. <laughs> okay. Here's my point. Is you're fine with what you got in your hand. Go after it. We're not responsible for translating the Bible, a pastor. You know what I'm responsible for? Teaching it. I'm not a translator. Much less would I venture into the translation process and be a weekend warrior on a pulpit with the... Li I'm just quoting somebody else. Right? Okay. The Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now what we're going to find out about a little bit today is what is the... It's on your outline there. The love of God that's shed abroad in your hearts. Verses 6 through 8. How far did the love of God go for us? Well, did we ever go after the love of God? Were you going after the love of God as an unsaved person, never having just once trusted in His payment for your sins on the cross of Calvary, past, present, and future? No. Is there any way to reach up to Him in our own strength? No. What did he do? What's his great love? He reached down for us. <laughs> Aren't you glad? He reached down for us. Notice what it says. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. What's that say about anything that we can do in our own moral strength? Paul talks about trying to, trying to function under the law, doesn't he? In Romans chapter 7. And, and what's the result? He said, I, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? That's the body of sin. That's what's connected to this world. And the three lusts. The lust of the, the lust of the, the pride of life. And Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the bondage of this flesh? What's the answer? The love of Christ. And God the Holy Spirit shed, shedding it abroad in your heart so that it's the governor of your activity and conduct. Now, when you hear the gospel, how, how, what's, um, who's been saved over 10 years in here? Okay, quite a few of you. Who's been saved over 15 years? Who's been saved over 20 years? Who's been saved over 30 years? <laughs> Exclamation point. <laughs> Who's been saved over 35 years? We're starting to weed folks out. Right? <laughs> Tire men. <laughs> What's the point? How many times have you heard the gospel? You can't even count it, right? Um, maybe you've heard some bad Gospels, but how many times have you heard the Gospel? Right? And you go, well, hey, here we go again, the Gospel. I'm sick of it. Is that our response? How come? How come? Because what gets rekindled in our hearts is that great love that He had for... Is that how you feel about your mother? You no, know, your mother loved you despite you, right? And you wonder why, but you really like mom. You know, you look at all these big, strong guys, and they're going, what? You know, like the football games, right? And what do they all say when the camera comes? Mom, right? The coach doesn't love me. The other players don't love me. The media doesn't love me, but my mom loves me. See, that's, that, that's, a, little, that's a little picture of it falls short. Moms are selfish sinners, too. But the point being that what we read in Romans 5, verses 6 through 8, is a divine love. I've told that story before. You see, what it does is it rekindles the fire of how... I was listening to somebody preach on the radio this morning. Galatians 2.20. Paul says, and gave himself for... Nope. Me. 
That's personal, isn't it? This is a personal thing, and that love, as you learn about it, and it gets spread about where you do what you do because you trust in it, not just what you know, but what you know and trust in in your heart, all of a sudden you're reminded of that great love, and you need to be reminded, don't you? It's funny how saved folk need the gospel as much as unsaved folk. They need that fire rekindled. It's not that they need it to believe again. They've believed. But there's more. And that's what Romans 5 is about. There's much more. Trouble doesn't work shame. That's why he says, Now trouble doesn't make us ashamed, and hope maketh not ashamed. We get hope from going through the trouble. We get experience. We exercise our faith rather unto godliness. Romans 5, 6 and 8, 7 and 8, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Now here's the thing. You know what a righteous man is? A righteous man pretty much irritates you. You know how you take that pencil and that paper clip from work home? People use that illustration a lot, right? But you justify little wrong things, don't you? What about the person that's going to do the right no matter what? The right thing no matter what? That pain in the neck. <laughs> He's making all of us do what? What do you think was going on in the family of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, he had brothers and sisters. I imagine the same thing. That pain in the neck. And you notice what happened in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when you look at his incarnation... At one point, Mary and the brethren are over here, and he's with the believers. And what's Mary saying? What's mom saying? We're doing, we're, we, we're, having, we're having a holiday. Come. And he says, I'm busy, and who am I with? Does he say? I'm with my mother, my brother, and my sisters. Where are you? Not until X does Mary get that thing straightened out. Okay. Note, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Who's going to put their life out there for someone that always does the right thing? It's, it's happened, right? But it's scarce. It's a, that's what it says, scarcely for a righteous man would one dare to die. Notice, yet peradventure, perhaps uh, an easier category of me giving up my life for another, which is the highest form of life that we can muster. And there's not very many folks participating. Note, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Okay, what's a good man? He, she, makes you feel good about yourself because what they do is bless others. They give them a deep abiding reason to rejoice. What's the best way to give a person a deep, abiding reason to rejoice? What's the best way? Give them the truth. Understood. Would be the best thing. And everything follows, right? That generosity of spirit follows. You give up your whole life to get the truth out. See, that's, he's saying for a good man. Somebody might even dare to die. But let's go to another category entirely. Look at verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Sinners. Enemy status. You know, we tell that little story. Um, let's say, I'll use my son. Uh, he works downtown. I see him downtown driving by. There, He's in an alley and four thugs jump them. Now, what would most dads do? Yeah, I don't know about most, but what would some do? Not a big deal. Come to his aid to protect him from the hooligans, right? Another scenario. Another scenario. Um, Sam and I are riding in the car, and we see a friend of both of ours in the alley, same thing happening. And we get out of there, and what do we do? 
We do the same thing. We interject ourselves for a friend. What's the Lord say is the greatest love there is that a man can muster? To give his life for his friend, his neighbor. Right? Third scenario. I'm driving with the friend, and my son's in the fray. And I jump out of the car, and the friend's reluctant. And I jump out of the car, and I grab the friend, and I go to the altercation. I take the, I take, I'm sorry, I'm with my son, and the friend's in the altercation. And I grab my son, I pull my friend out, my son out. And I, t uh, I got this all messed up, sorry. <laughs> Just so you can follow. I got my son with me. And he's totally with me. I skipped one of the scenarios. That's why I'm mixing two. He's totally with me. There's the friend. I take the friend. I pull him out. I take my son. I thrust him in. That's verse 8. That's called divine love. He loved us, and we weren't lovable. Not only were we sinners, notice it says, take a look at... Verse 9, for if when we were what? Enemies. Enemies. The Father took the Son and thrust the Son into what? A band of enemies. Uh, is there any love like that on earth? That's divine love. He loved us. That's the love that He wants us there's two parts to the law. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul. And then what's the second part of the law? Love thy neighbor as thy... See that? I combined them. I wrongly combined them. They call it a mea culpa, culpa a mistake. Um, look at Hebrews 12.2. Hebrews 12.2. Hebrews 12.2. What I want you to do is connect Hebrews 12.2 to Romans 5 in this regard. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the what? Romans 5. For we are not a... Why? We're not ashamed of trouble. Was he in trouble? I mean, one of the most painful things I've ever read in the Bible is, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. That's a painful thing to read, isn't it? That's what he did for us. Just like I thrust my son into the fray, and he screams out, my, my father, why have you forsaken me, abandoned me? Do you see that? He says he despised the shame. Do we like trouble? No hands. <laughs> trouble worketh what? Patience. Patience experience and experience hope. We went through that before. You'll have to look on YouTube. But here's the thing. We're not ashamed in Christ. Because who took on the shame for us? He did. It's going to be a shameful thing to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the great white, white throne judgment and give an answer for your videotape. Wouldn't you love to watch all the secret things that you don't want anybody to know? And stand before Him. You think you're a lawyer? Go at it. See how that goes. You remember the religious types that were the lawyers that went up to him and they were tempting him in the beginning of his ministry? What'd they do by Matthew chapter 11? Any more questions But what they determined to do? Kill him. That's enough of this. He's a buzzsaw. I'm going to contend with the Most High God of heaven and earth in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He took the shame for us. That's why we're in a situation where we're at peace with God. 
and we're not ashamed by the circumstances. Sometimes I look at folks and, like even my family, and I've had these things like, why are you doing what you're doing? <laughs> why aren't you um, an astronaut? <laughs> you know, why aren't you like your grandfather? Why, 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 what are you doing? Can I explain it to him? Eh, I'm just a jerk, I guess. <laughs> I mean, they're not going to get it, are they? Can I explain it to them? No. Can't explain it to them. I can't show. They can't see it by sight. We walk by what? Faith. You know, the evangelical and charismatic world, it came about, you know, a quarter of the way, a third of the way through this century, last century. Covenant theology. Uh, how do the Jews? The Jews walk by what? If, if all the promises that were made to Israel have been transferred to the church, the body of Christ, then you've got to walk by sight. The charismatics, they want to go back to Acts chapter 2 and say the church started there. Why? There's a whole bunch of sight there. Isn't there? Those manifestation gifts, you can see them. Paul says to us, we walk by not sight. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is an important principle, <laughs> to say the least, in your Christian life. And it starts out pretty early in Romans chapter 5. People see that trouble, the kind of trouble you're involved in, you should be ashamed of it. I'm ashamed of it. I want to be insulated from trouble. I want personal peace and affluence. I worked real hard so that I could be insulated from the trouble that the rabble are involved in. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. While we look not at the things which are... 2 Corinthians 4, 18. Are seen. 2 Corinthians 4, 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Romans 8, it says, we have a hope. If the hope was seen, it wouldn't be a what? A hope. We're waiting for something. We're waiting to be clothed from above. And it's going to happen one generation. Our eternal life's now. We're just waiting for the clothing that allows us to function in the abode that He's prepared for us. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Here's a fact. Verse 16. The outward man is perishing. We don't want to admit that, do we? You know, we bow down to the gods of the medical community. When God tells us what about this thing we're wearing right now? Worm food. Worm food. Pretty worm food, maybe, but worm food. For which cause we faint not when the trouble comes. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And what's its foundation? The love of Christ. We've studied the five times Paul writes the love of Christ and what it's associated with. Here's what he did for us. You're right there, 2 Corinthians 5. And we'll talk about next week what that great love provided. Much more than our justification. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He despised the shame. But what, what did he look toward? The joy that was set before him, which was the resurrection from the dead, and to be preeminent, and bring back rule and authority to the universe at the right hand of God the Father, the triune God, the three in one. But this time, what's in his wake? A host. 
us and the host that's going to replenish the earth, a righteous host in the heaven and in the earth, who knew no sin. He's the only one that could have made the payment. We just read Romans 5, 6 through 8. No one else could make the payment except him without sin, which was the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might be made what? Right. He dealt with sin the right way. He paid for it. And we can be made the righteousness of God by grace through faith. Grace is a gift. How hard is it to, to, to pass from death to life and find yourself in the eternal purpose of God? And we'll talk about this. Life. How hard is it? It's not hard. Believing is not hard. Letting go of the things of this life, letting them drop, and go... Why do those football players like mom? Because she's a blessing to them in this life. Much less, who wouldn't want the love of the Lord Jesus Christ? A divine love, so much greater that it's an illegitimate contrast. All they need to do is know it. Stop trusting in yourself. You'll end up in Romans 7, O oh, wretched man that I am hugging babies, and wanting to return to the day when you didn't have. You weren't so entangled with sin. Love of God, right there. Romans chapter 5, 6 through 8. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the five times we read the phrase much more. Okay? Here's the thing. Romans chapter 4, Paul got us past Abraham. Romans chapter 5, Paul gets us past Adam. We'll talk about that some more. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We pray that each one here could get not just a grip on these things and know them, but reckon them so and trust them and yield their bodies and allow the love of Christ to be the governing factor in all that they say or do in word and deed. In the Lord Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.